What I thought I'd talk to you today about is what goes on in your brain as you are having pleasure. And as you will know, the brain is a strange instrument. But it's a strange instrument that one can probe in many different ways. Here's a good friend of mine, Tipu Assis, talking to a potential future patient about the kind of work that we've been doing together. Um, and the kind of work that we've been doing together is, I think, quite remarkable. And I, I hope to think that you like to think that that's the same. Um, what we do is, if you have certain diseases like Parkinson's, we can implant electrodes into your brains to help you get better. So what I'm going to show you now is one of our patients who suffers from Parkinson's. And as you will know, Parkinson's is a progressive disease that gives you all kinds of problems, one of them being tremor. Now this patient in particular has a hemi-Parkinsonian tremor, meaning that he only has Parkinsonian symptoms on one side of the body. We've drilled a hole and inserted an electrode in one side of his brain, connected that up with a lead that goes under the skin, and there's a, there's a battery in his chest, a thing that makes him at all times get stimulation from that electrode. And he'll explain that to him, uh, himself. And then at a certain point in the video, he'll turn himself off. And you will see what he's like when we don't have that pacemaker in him. And then I'll talk about what that might mean. But maybe he should be allowed to talk first. The probe of the brain, I understand, comes level with the top of the nose and the ear. And it is connected to a part in my chest, in, in, in my... Uh, underneath the skin of my chest here. And this is controlled. I can control the amount of the voltage going in. I can control the length of time that the pulse is. And I can identify the number of times per second that it goes in. And I'll turn myself off now. So one of the problems is not only as you can appreciate is that you can't do very much for yourself. The whole personal hygiene has to be done by somebody else. But because of my concentration now it is up to 90% of my tremor and trying to control it. And I'm thinking the word Parkinson's all the time. I'm not terribly, uh, I'm not concentrating on my conversation with you at all. Well, this looks a bit cruel, but it's important that he keeps his autonomy. He should be able to turn himself back on, which is what he's doing now. So as you can see, the effects are instantaneous. We stimulate his STN, the subthalamic nucleus, 130 hertz, and you can see immediately he gets better. Now, this is not a cure. This is something that helps with the symptoms for a while and will make him be able to shave and have a normal life, but it's not a cure. A cure would take something different. Think about kids with dystonia. Think about kids with movement disorders. And let me show you an example of another one of our patients. This is a young girl who's got dystonia, which is progressive movement disorders <laughs> that, that basically means that she's unable to control the kind of movement she does. You can see she's finding it very difficult to stand up. She's finding it very difficult to just hold her hands out like that. Now, if we implant, in this case, a bilateral electrode into the globus pallidus internus, which is a part of the basal ganglia, and again, connect that to a battery in her chest. And then we wait 18 months, we get this. This is a girl who's got her life back. This is a girl that, for all intents and purposes, will be go able to go to mainstream schooling. Now, if you notice as she's walking along here, you'll see that her left arm is not quite there. This is why it took 18 months, because, of course, there are lots of things that happens in terms of the muscles that have to be retrained. 
Now, you wouldn't recognize her if you moved down the street. She's still well, she's still doing good, and as far as we know, she will continue to do well as long as she's got that implant. So why is it that it works, and could one think about doing that for other things, like neuropsychiatric disorders, like happiness? In fact, what is the science of happiness? Well, the first thing I think one has to realize, and I think we all realize that, is that happiness is subtle and complex. And yet, the lack of happiness is devastating. This is the key cardinal symptom of depression, for instance. So Aristotle had a lot of things to say about that, and I think quite insightful things. He talked about two elements. He talked about hedonia, which is the pleasure element, and then he talked about eudaimonia, which is meaning. Meaning, of course, is much harder to study with electrodes and put people in scanners. So I've chosen to look at what hedonia is, what pleasure is. And if you think about it, hedonia is actually quite a smart thing. It means that the kinds of things that makes us survive are the kinds of things that we are attracted to. And so that means that things like food, sex, and other people are the basic pleasures. And understanding those, of course, is one of the key elements. So what about asking people what they like? So if you look, not surprisingly, as the film showed in Italy, what most people think about all the time is sex. This is a thousand American women, working women, who for 24 hours was asked to tell us what they like the most. And they like sex. The only problem was they only had a sex for about 15 minutes during that day. And it was only 20% of them that had sex on that day. Notice also that the thing that they really disliked was the commute, not to mention the work. So why did they have to go to work? But the second most important thing, of course, was socializing. And it turns out that the things that most people like is to be with friends and relatives. They hate being alone and they hate being the boss. Um, what does that tell us? We probably shouldn't be the boss, right? Um, but there's an interesting question here because, of course, what people self-report and what actually happens may not need to be the same thing. So in my work, I've become quite interested in what it is that makes us survive. So obviously, sex is good for getting kids, but what about when we have kids? What is it about those kids? They're vulnerable. And of course, with the extended childhood, we need to take care of them. And yet things like parental postnatal depression is a key factor. 10 to 15% of both men and women will suffer from this. And so if there's something wrong, we need to find ways of understanding that. And so to do that, we have to look inside the brain with big brain scanners. And when we do that, we see all these colorful blobs. This is like a neurophrenology. In the old days, when they were just starting to think about skulls, they thought that the shape of the skull was very important. If there was a big bump here, you were very good at languages. If there was a big bump over here, you liked children. And these days with the scanners, of course, we get very similar kind of images. We're missing the collars here, but there, you know, there are red collars here and blue collars there. We're not saying that there are specific skills, but we are saying that there is activity in that area that correlates with something. But how to make sense of that? How to make sense of the kinds of menus that we get when we are diagnosing things like depression. One of the key features, as you will see, is depressed mood, but the second most important thing is anhedonia, the lack of pleasure. So if we could really understand pleasure, we could also potentially do something about it in those who are depressed. And we could also do some things about the bipolar that a lot of people suffer from. You can see up here how it is that people are up for a long time. These are daily ratings in a normal person. This is in a bipolar patient. And then you're down for a long time, and then you're manic for a while. And it looks like a completely chaotic process. But in fact, the statistics of this, the mathematics of this, shows that this is a lower dimensional fractal process, meaning that it's actually quite a well-ordered one. And that well-ordered system is something we can now start to make computational models of. We can start to make very complex dynamical systems models that allows us to change things. So how do we do that? That's what I'm trying to tell you about today. So again, I think we have to look back into history. This is what it used to be like, having a trepanation, having brain surgery. The only thing we've kept from those days are the headgear, um, <laughs> which of course is still important. Um, and we also came to realize that it's not really necessarily the body that is that important, it's about how the brain integrates that, which is the important. And in order to do that, we use these big scanners. We use these things, these MRI scanners that most of you will have tried. And when we put people into those scanners, we realize that the brains are actually very, very similar. Here's just 15 random brains of people that I've scanned. 
One of them is a very famous Danish TV presenter who had to hold my hand as she was being filmed, being in my scanner. But you wouldn't be able to tell which of those brains is hers. You wouldn't, in fact, be able to tell me which of them were man and which were woman. And even my highly skilled colleagues wouldn't be able to say that. There is no structural gross differences between the male and the female brain. There may be ways in which we are socialized that gives rise to different functional activity, but that's a different matter altogether. But what is it, in fact, seeing? This is an iris. This is the only part of the brain that you can see with the naked eye. And that changes with generations, with time. And when you look at things, you may find it very difficult to see what it is. To these, to you, to the naked eye, this looks like it's just a random collection of black dots. And yet all I need to do is show you this image. And then you can't help but see two little girls playing in the sun. So what is it that happens in our brains as we are doing that? So to do that, I've created a little animation for you. And when my colleagues in Oxford look at that, they say, Oh, yes, Morton, you're Danish, aren't you? Hamlet, alas, poor Yorick, I knew him so well. <laughs> and I guess I can't run away from that, being Danish. And yet, what I was trying to show is what I'm now trying to show you in a different kind of way. And again, I'm sorry about the colors, which we have lost because of the lighting. But basically, what you can see is the brain from the side. Here's where the eyes would be. This is the brain from the top. Again, the eyes looking that way. And this is just my brain looking straight at you. And what you can see here in different colors is at the back of the brain, when you put somebody in a scanner, you'll see that this is the visual cortex. This is where you would have activity when you are as you are looking at me. As you're listening to me, you'll get this in this darker blue area. If I was to touch you or the person next to you would touch you, you'd probably be surprised, but you would also have parts of your brain that would be active, namely the somatosensory cortex. And in here, it's getting nice and sweaty for later on. You will have this kind of feel, the smell of Christiania. <laughs> and you might even have the taste. I had a lovely dinner just before of Indian food. So in other words, there's a way in which the sensorium, there are certain parts of your brain that will just register the world. Now, importantly, that doesn't change. However much alcohol or food you've had, it will still be able to recognize that that is Jack Daniels or whatever we're having for cocktails later. I personally can't have Jack Daniels, but that's another story. Um, so that doesn't change. But of course, like with any map, what is really important are the parts of the map where there's just white spots, right? In the old days, the, car, the, the map makers would say, here be dragons. <laughs> and it's the dragons that we are chasing tonight. This is Game of Thrones part three. <laughs> so one of the things I've been doing to keep myself busy is I've actually made, together with my friend Annie Catrell, we've made a series of sculptures where we've rapid prototyped these particular, the, the seeing, the hearing, the touching, the smelling, and the tasting. And this is really like a 21st portrait of what it's like to be a person. Not to evaluate it, but just to experience the world. But what is it really that happens when we experience the world? What is it about chocolate that is so darn good that I had to have my own sort of stash with me. What is it about being a hedonist? As with Magritte, he had a patron who uh, famously loved the good things in life so much, in fact, that he didn't really get much pleasure out of it. Because, of course, if you're constantly pursuing happiness, and Americans, of course, will let us know that that's what they're doing. In fact, what you're doing is not really getting any much pleasure. It becomes more like a, an urge. It becomes more like an obsession. So what is it really that you're thinking about? As you will know, Freud had the answer to everything. And yet my contention and the reason why I do this research, apart from it being extraordinarily f interesting and fun, is that if we could understand pleasure in the human brain, we could also understand how to fix it in those where it's no longer working. So in order to treat affective disorders, we need to understand pleasure. And so in order to do that, we need to understand what I call the pleasure cycle. It is about having that urge to have cocktails and not being able to have it because you have to give a talk for 45 minutes. <laughs> I'm wanting things. I'm in this phase. I know that at some point I will be able to engage with those cocktails and there will be liking. There might even be momentary, very large peaks of liking, and I hope to have many of those tonight. <laughs> but at some point, like most of you, I will have had enough and I can do something else. So. 
Pleasure is all about making those state transitions. It's about switching between these systems and doing it in an orderly fashion that allows me to pursue and survive. So what does that mean? Well, think about sex. Some people do it all the time. This is a study that I would have loved to have done in Oxford. The problem is that we are meant to close our eyes and think of England. So it was very difficult to get ethical permission to actually have people have sex in the scanner. <laughs> so I, I did what every sensible person would do in this particular situation. I engaged with the Dutch. And I, I'm sure you'll be happy to know. <laughs> so I'm sure you'll be happy to know that I've just learned that Jay, our godfather, in fact, has Flemish and, and has people from, from Holland as part of his ancestry. So that again makes perfect sense. So here's my friend Yanniko, putting women in the scanner, looking for that elusive female orgasm. And exactly because it's elusive, because only about 30% of women get orgasms on a regular basis, he did a study where he looked at what happened when women were lying in his scanner and either faked an orgasm or had an orgasm. What is different? It's a bit like that Woody Allen sketch where his soon-to-be ex-wife, I think it was Mia Farrow at the time, strangely prophetical, she kind of looked at him in disgust and said, I faked all my orgasms. And Woody kind of puffed himself up and goes, so did I. <laughs> in this particular study, very scientific, we had a way of finding out whether women actually had orgasms or not. Now, unfortunately, I'm sworn to secrecy. Usually when I go out talking in the old days, I used to happily tell people what the trick is from the peripheral system how to tell. But then there were these two lovely ladies that came up to me and they said, please don't tell our husbands. Please don't tell them. <laughs> so we may be able to take it as question time later, but be sure to notice that the key thing here is that there's a difference in the orbital frontal cortex, the frontal part of your brain, which is activated when you have real pleasure. And so it means that when I then sat down with Yanniko and looked at all the studies where people either were looking at films or videos of things, there was desire, wanting. Different systems engage once you were aroused, once you have lubrication and so on. And different things happen when you are in the plateau phase where you could be for a long time. And certainly other things happen when you had the orgasm or in the case of most women, not. And then <laughs> when you had the refraction period. In many ways, I usually use this and I say to women, you've got to train your partner. It's not true what, um, what Freud said about, about penis envy. It's all about breast envy. I know this, having two daughters. But of course, what he also means, what he said was that you can have orgasms through vaginas. Now, some women are able to do it, but in fact, it's only because they're indirect stimulation of the clitoris. And yet, it still surprises me how few people seem to know this. So that's a tip for later. <laughs> um, but what about chocolate? What about the pleasure of food? Um, so I was interested in what I call the dessert stomach phenomenon. This is what my daughters are very interested in. They, it's funny how when we've had the big meal, they always got room for that chocolate dessert. And they think it's because we have this extra little stomach that we can take out. So I thought I should investigate this. Unfortunately, I didn't do whole body MRI scanning, so I don't actually know whether we have a dessert stomach. I, I just looked at the brain. So I had a study where I had people come to the scanner hungry, and I asked them to, um, and I made sure that they liked tomato juice and they liked chocolate milk, and they were lying down in my scanner. I gave them a squirt, one and a half milliliters of chocolate milk. Then I gave them a rinse. I didn't tell them it was artificial saliva, but it had to be something that had the main ionic components of saliva. It was artificial, it wasn't something I produced. Um, <laughs> but it's important it's not water, because water, of course, when you're hungry, is something that makes you... Anyway. Um, then they got a little bit of chocolate milk, and then we repeated the process for 20 minutes. And people, because they were hungry and they'd been screened before, they liked the chocolate milk, they liked the tomato juice, they were good. And then, to their surprise, after the 20 minutes, I took them out of the scanner, and then half of the subjects I invited to drink as much tomato juice as they could possibly have. It's a bit like a Monty Python sketch, really. Remember the one from Meaning of Life? Just a tiny mint leaf, sir. Just a... <laughs> and then the other half had a lot of chocolate milk. And now, to their surprise, I then put them back in the scanner and did exactly the same thing again. Gave them a little bit of chocolate milk, which if they just had a lot of chocolate milk, and it was about a liter for those who were drinking. 
They didn't really like it that much. <laughs> and, but then they gave them the tomato juice, and suddenly, yeah, tomato juice, great, right? And then chocolate milk, ooh. So anyway, so I then looked at what are the parts of the brain that changes, that stay high to both of them initially, and stay low to the one that you've been sated on, the dessert stomach phenomena. And it's great because it basically controls for everything. It controls for satiety effects and so on. And when you look at that, it turns out that it's the same part of the brain that is active when you have orgasms. It's the orbital frontal cortex and various other regions in the basal ganglia, the nucleus accumbens, the ventral pallidum, the anterior cingulate. But it's a network of regions that are talking to each other saying, this is great. <laughs> and it's the very same regions that are active. And for, go figure this. I couldn't get ethical permission to do a sex study, but I could do a study on crystal meth. <laughs> In drug naive Oxford undergraduates. <laughs> Hopefully they were, tr yeah, no, I know. <laughs> so when you do that and you put people in scanners, you deliver intravenously crystal meth. Again, because of the ethics, we couldn't ask people how pleasurable it was. We could only ask them how much how much their mind were racing. Now, luckily, the two usually go together. It's like a good cup of coffee, really is pleasurable, but it also makes your mind race. So this is when we injected them at this point. And as you can see, it goes up and then it tapers off. Classical kind of pleasure cycle. And then we looked at what is happening in their brain as they're having these peak experiences of, for the first time, ever trying this great drug called crystal meth. Now, this is not a condoning crystal meth. It's just saying that what happens with all drugs of abuse is something that they give you pleasure initially. And of course, what they happens is that they activate exactly the same regions that I've just been talking to you about. So you have the wanting and the liking. Now what happens with drug of abuse is that after a while, the liking goes out the window, but the wanting goes up. People become excited about the things that lead to the drug and not the actual drug experience itself. It's called incense and salience, and it's a really powerful and very wrought and horrible process that leaves some people that come into contact with this as poppies, as people that seem to have no power of their own. It's a terrible process and is one that we are hoping to be able to reverse by understanding these systems. We also were interested in, again, don't ask me why, but we were able to do a study on gambling. Now, the interesting thing about money is that money, of course, is very difficult to satiate on. It's too, very difficult to have too much money. I don't know whether anybody's tried it. Um, I have, but that was because I was eating it at the time. And that is, in fact, the only way to have too much money is to eat it. So there's something really funny about the way the monetary rewards works. That means that it's very different from the other kinds of rewards. But when you do that, you find that there are different parts, again, of the same circuitry that reacts to that. And so I become very interested in this horrible disease called consumption, and I'm not talking about the 18th century version, which is tuberculosis, but the consumption that is part of who we are now. Why is it that we are so driven by these things? And so we've written a book about this, trying to think about what it is that makes us into these, these strange creatures. So what I've been telling you about then is a circuitry of different things that happens in your brain. This prefrontal part, about these nucleus accumbens, about all these ways that different chemicals are changing the electrical magnetic signals of your brain and how that happens. And we now have a fairly good understanding of the difference between wanting something, liking something, and being sated on something, and how it is that we change those things. We have that for, first and foremost from rats. What you have to remember is that the rat brain is no larger than my thumb. So in order to collect that kind of data, we need the kind of patients that I described to you earlier, the patients with deep brain electrodes. So here's an example of a patient who's got blackout. Um, who's got deep brain stimulation for um, chronic pain. So if you have your hand amputated, what can happen is you can develop a phantom limb pain in that hand. It happens to about 25% of the people that have amputations, and it can be absolutely devastating. And sometimes it gets so bad that people are suicidal and we have no option but to implant. And when we do that, we usually implant very deep in the brain, in a part of the brain called the new called the thalamus, that was meant to be a, um, so the thalamus is deep in the brain and there's another part called the periacodoctal gray, which is again deep in the brain. And when we do that, we can stimulate that particular part of the brain. And if we scan people at the same time to look at what happens in the rest of the brain, we find that when they get pain relief, i.e. when it's no longer, 
when it actually is pleasurable, that is that you go from something that is painful to pleasurable, you find that there's activity again in the same part of the brain that were active when you had food and good sex and, and drugs. So in many ways that of course tells us something about the link between pleasure and pain. Because it turns out that it must be the same circuitry which is linked together. And so again together with Annie we created a sculpture called Pleasure and Pain where we took the wiring of where we stick the electrode and we worked out what is the wiring that is making that possible. If we stimulate at 20 hertz, we make the pain go away. If we turn the knob to 50 hertz, the pain comes back. We turn it up to 90 hertz and suddenly the pain becomes even more unbearable, suggesting that pain and pleasure are really linked in those kind of strange ways. So this might explain some things about certain sexual practices, but that's for another talk. Um, and surprisingly difficult to get ethics for in Oxford. Guys, go and make you laugh now. Ready? Goes on and on and on. <laughs> YouTube. <laughs> YouTube for laughing babies. Great for Monday mornings. Why am I showing this video? Imagine what it's like when they're crying, by the way. Why am I showing you this video? Because I think we need to come up with solutions. I'm not sure you can cure phantom limb pains, but I think you can help with the kinds of happiness that we've been talking about. Because it turns out that even if you grow up in a sink like this little baby, you can still grow up to have full and happy lives. Um, so why is that? And what is it that happens to us as we're trying to protect those little babies? What is it that is happening in our brains as we are getting attuned to either baby faces compared to adult faces? What is it about the features of the face? What is it about the, what is it about the auditory features of baby crying or baby laughing compared to that of adults, that just attracts us. So Conrad Lawrence was a Nobel Prize winning ethologist who won a lot of prizes for his work. Um, Walt Disney clearly read his work because he changed Mickey Mouse from quite a nasty rodent into quite a cute one. Here's Conrad Lawrence with his animal of choice. Um, and the geese, he showed that if you show their face to them at a certain point in their development, they think you're their mother. It doesn't quite work like that with, with, with kids, but what is very clear is that there's something about those features that makes us just look at them. And so I used a special tool that we got in Oxford a few years ago, and we recently had one in Aarhus that we're using a lot, is a giant hair dryer. It's a very expensive giant hair dryer. It's called a magnet magnetoencephalography, an MEG scanner. And what it is, it's um, liquid helium that is basically making sure that these squids, these are very sensitive devices that allows you to, you, via the bind josephson junction, allows you to pick out the magnetic component of the electromagnetic signal emanating from your brain. Um, but it has to happen at very low temperatures, hence the liquid helium. Um, there's a worldwide um, shortage of helium that is concentrated in Oxford. Um, because of all these helium balloons. So for the longest time, we could only do this work in Aarhus, but that's another story. Um, what happens here is that you are then able to look at what happens in the brain, not just in terms of what is the blood flow is doing to the brain, but what is happening at very short time intervals, because you can sample the brain over 2,000 times a second. And so you can basically find out how it is that this electromagnetic um, information is flowing through the brain. So I thought, why not do this with the baby faces and the adult faces? Why not see what happens? Now, some of you may know the work of Oliver Sacks. Oliver, sadly, is terminally ill, as some of you may know. But he wrote a wonderful book called The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat, which was one of his patients who had a lesion to the parts of his fusiform face area, which is part of the visual cortices. If I sort of was to drill in, I won't do it now, um, about five centimeters in this way, I will hit the face area. Now, if that, for some reason, becomes compromised, 
if you have a hemorrhage and it's no longer working, you can't recognize faces. And this is what happened to his patient. He was no longer able to recognize his wife, and that's why he thought she was a hat. Um, hence the name of the book. But a long story just to tell you that really what happens when you recognize faces, as you're looking at those two faces, there will be activity in your brain. This is the brain. This is where the eyeballs would be. I'm looking, you're looking at me sort of from below. And this part is where you get activity after 130 milliseconds. This is when we show them the image, and this is when you get activity. And there's no significant difference between this to the adult face and to the baby faces in this area. People have known this for a long time. That wasn't particularly exciting. So I thought that what happened when we looked at babies was that things were going in what we call the dorsal and ventral stream. You get things coming into your eye, pops to the back of the brain, and then moves forward, and eventually you get pleasure in the frontal part of your brain. You make an evaluation, and you do the right thing. Now, this study showed me something that I didn't know and was hugely interesting and exciting, namely that when you look at a baby, at the same time as you recognize it as a baby, there's activity in the frontal part of your brain in your pleasure network, which is not pleasant, uh, which is pleasant, but is not present in the, in the adult. What does that mean? I was puzzled by this for the longest time. Then we did a lot of modeling, and we worked out that really what is happening is almost like a pre-attentive signal. Like when you hear a baby cry somewhere, you can't help but move your attention to it. So immediately when you recognize something, you have to evaluate that for potential threat or danger or joy. And so when you do that, there's something about babies that just means that you do that. And interestingly, in a study that we're about to publish, we did the same thing with baby crying compared to Oxford winning actresses crying, <laughs> talking about their dog and their dog crying as well. And what happens is that, again, for auditory things, you get activity in your auditory cortex at about 100 milliseconds, which is what I'm showing you here. Same thing for both of them. But what also happens for the crying is that immediately at the same time, you get activity in your orbital frontal cortex only to the crying, which is exciting because, again, it shows us that, and this were all happening, by the way, I should mention, in adults who are not yet parents. So this is something that is present in all of us. At the moment, I'm engaged in a large study to see what happens to us as we become parents. I will scan people before they, before they get pregnant. I will help them get pregnant. No, I will scan them after, <laughs> after they've had the baby. And then I'll scan them 18 months later to see how the brain changes, not just functionally, but also structurally. Because, of course, as I'm sure you know, some of my colleagues have shown that if you learn to juggle, and you can learn to juggle quite well in about three weeks. Your brain changes. And so imagine what it will do to you if you had a baby. But remarkably, it's the one thing that unites all of us in this room is that we have parents, or at least at some point had. And yet we know nothing. We know nothing. We know nothing about what happens to us as part of that. So what happens if there's something wrong with a baby? What happens if you have a cliff lip like this young lad here? What happens is that that parental signature that I showed you before, this thing up in the orbital frontal cortex is much diminished. So at the moment, we're trying to find ways in which we can try to help parents not look at the facial abnormality, but look at the eyes and all the other great features about this little baby and see whether in that way we can change the pre-attentive way of looking at it. And we're currently scanning the brains of the surgeons and the nurses that are working with these in order to find a way in which we can help with this particular relationship. And talking about helping, talking about the kinds of things that happens to people that become mentally ill, when they look themselves in the mirror and have body dysmorphia, when they run away shouting, what is it about the way that the brain works? What is it about these networks? How is it that they change? How is it that that one ring to rule them all, the default mode network, which happens in your brain, how is it that that is severely changed in depression? And how is it that the only thing that really helps with depression at the moment is ECT? It's a very rough and ready thing, but it's the one thing that really has clinical evidence. What, one of the things we know that happens when you scan people before and after ECT is that they basically rebalance the brain for a while. And so how does that work? What is the science of this? So we got very excited, and I thought I'd throw some up some, uh, 
some equations because it is science after all, right? So uh, don't give, get worried about that. That's just a simple Kuramoto oscillator. And it's basically a way of thinking about how it is that the brain is talking to itself. What is it about the way that these oscillatory networks are working together in order to do their thing? And in a hand wavy kind of way, but you can read my papers, I can explain to you that really it happens to be not when your brain is incoherent, where there's not sufficient coherence between the things, when there's too much synchrony, you have to be in what we call cluster synchrony, what we call a meter-stable region. Things where there are the cusp of a bifurcation, where you can either go that way or you can go that way. And it turns out that that's the optimal place for your brain to be in. And one of the things that happens in neuropsychiatric disorders is that your brain moves away from that bifurcation and suddenly is no longer able to re-stabilize in that way. And we've now got models that can explain what happens in the normal brain in terms of how it is that these networks are talking to each other. And we have very good models that we can do, not just for the Bose signal, that is the blood flow and the hemoglobin that is changed for that, but also in terms of the actual MEG signal. So the actual, if you like, neural spiking of the models. And we can now show in these models that we can change that in things like schizophrenia. We can show what it is about the structural connectivity of net networks that bring about the symptoms of schizophrenia. And in a paper that I recently published with my good friend Gustavo Deco, who is an extraordinary man, we've now got big plans to think how we can use that to change neuropsychiatric praxis. Now, whether it means whether we need to put in more electrodes, I don't think so. I think what we have to do is we have to find the things that work in terms of behavioral therapies, cognitive behavioral therapies, measure what happens in the brains and find out how it is that we can rebalance those brains. So I'm not sure electrodes are the answer. I think there's a different kind of singing the mind electric that might well be even better. And that, of course, comes back to the man James Brown, the hardest working man working in show business. Steven Pinker is a neuropsychologist of some note that some of you may know. He wrote a book called The Language Instinct, where he wrote this complete nonsense. He wrote, music could vanish from our species and the rest of our lifestyle would be virtually unchanged. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> is, could that be true? I think Apple would be out of business if that was true. So what is it about music? that sings our mind electric. What is it about what happens to our brains as we're listening to music? So and work together with Peter Wust, who is a professional jazz musician and now the director of the center we are setting up in, in Aarhus. Um, we were very interested in this. So let's have an example. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure all of you are too old to remember the old Montmartre, but this is what some of us used to do back in the day. So what is it about rhythm? What is it about rhythm that is so intensely pleasurable that, you know, don't be German about it, you can move, right? <laughs> I, 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 I gave this talk at the Max Planck Institute in, um, in Munich, which is where Kreppelin, the great psychiatrist, was based. And they were all sitting there. <laughs> this is not funny. <laughs> now, interestingly, as you may know, there's no word for pleasure in German. <laughs> At which point, there's always some guy in the back that puts up his hands and says, Nein, that is not, it is not right. Can't have a word. Mm -hmm. Wohlgefallen. <laughs> At which point you usually just have to ask him whether he would ever use that after sex. <laughs> or at all. It doesn't mean, of course, that the Germans don't believe in pleasure. I keep going there to talk about pleasure. Um, talk about pleasure. <laughs> it's just like the English pretending that schadenfreude is not a, an English feeling, so we have to use a German word about it. But I think more to the point, I think there is something really interesting about rhythm and about pleasure. It's like 
this Rubin is either vast or two faces looking at each other, but you can't do both at the same time, except for my friend Christian sitting over there. Um, what is it about the beat? What is it about the syncopation? What is it about our representation of the beat and the syncopation sitting on top of that? What is it that makes something funky? We were really interested in this. So we took the, the drum breaks from famous funk music and we did them with a snare and a hi-hat and we had three different examples. So here's an example where we had low syncopation. So we took examples of things that were close to the beat. So if you listen to this. You see the Germans marching, yes? <laughs> but even that, they were sitting in the front row going, hmm. <laughs> so it's not that funky, is it? I mean, it'd be difficult to dance to. Now, what if you, what if you mix it up a bit? What if you put a bit of syncopation in there, but you still keep the level there and to be the same? So the same kind of beats, but you just shift the beats around ever so slightly. So we took examples of that. Here's an, one example of that. And there was a guy there wiggling his toe. <laughs> There's something quite funky about that, right? I mean, it's difficult to sit still. So if a little is good, then a lot must be great, right? That's usually how it works, right? So let's put a lot of syncopation in there. Let's see what happens. <laughs> Doesn't really work for me. I don't know whether it works for you. If you are into free jazz, maybe, yeah? Um, so yeah, so there's something really interesting here, and it turns out that, oh, they'll never stop, nine. <laughs> so if you ask people how much it wants to make them want to move, these are the low ones, doesn't really ma ma make them want to move, but the medium ones, they want to make them move, the high ones, not at all, and similar with the pleasure. So in other words, most pleasure experiences are like inverted U-shapes. It's about being on the cusp of that U-shape. It's about having just the right balance between things. It's about variation. It's not about abstinence. It's about finding the right kind of spaces. I hope we will later tonight once this is over. So what is it then that happens in the brain? Well, it's exactly what I've just told you. You have these systems that allow you to work out that there's some music out there, there's some people you can dance to, there might even be mating partners out there at some point that I could study, hopefully. <laughs> but also what happens as you do that, and you do that with other people, there's a whole kind of set of regions in your brain that are talking feverishly to each other saying, this is great. And what is great about music is it can go, it can go all night. It's unlike the women that I showed you earlier, it's not just 15 minutes. It's all night. So that I think is wonderful. And so those are the kinds of things that we will look at in this new center that we are setting up in, in Aarhus. We're having the opening on the 5th of June. You're all invited. Um, pleasure and well-being then. I think I've showed you that they're central to our lives. I hope that I've convinced you that this is really worth studying. Not only is it worth studying because we can help people, but also because it's fun. And I hope you've been enlightened as to what it is that makes it so interesting and so fun. I hope you will start thinking about making a career of this. We need more people. It's also quite difficult. <laughs> but I think especially the parental brain could be a way into understanding what it is that makes happy lives. But I think we've got to start at that level. And I think we really need to understand that before we can make anything. So I've written a book. I've written several books. This is my latest one on emotion, which sort of lays it all out for a, a lay audience. I've also written some, a pink book. And when you write a pink book like this, the Pleasure Center, your colleagues in Oxford look and you say, Morton, are you sure that's science? <laughs> At which point I had to produce this book, which is a magnum opus, which is a book when dropped from third floor can kill a man. <laughs> so if there is such a thing as gory details, this is where you should drop them. And finally, here are some of the people in my lab that have made all of this possible and who I, of course, thank for all the work that is hereby acknowledged. But first and foremost, thanks to all of you for making this such a pleasure and let's make this a pleasurable evening. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>